crunching the numbers, empirical studies of formative assessment trials. Ruth Coker. Excuse me, everybody. We're starting the next panel. I can't whistle, sorry. Uh, Ruth Coker is going to talk to us about a case study of formative assessments, and then Andrew Noble is going to speak to us about formative peer review, and David Siegel will talk to us about whether we should bother reaching out. Well, thank you. Do we have 15 minutes? Is that what we're doing? Thank you, and I'd like to um, join everyone else and thank the organizers who've really done a marvelous job. Um, and, it's a, and I'm really so happy to be in this group. I usually talk about disability issues, and I usually go to disability conferences where I walk into the room and I know everyone, and here I'm in a room with strangers, so thank you for welcoming me, because this is not my normal um, uh, topic to be, to, to be dealing with. And, I had my hand raised vigorously. I would like to talk about laptop use, but I don't have time now. What I just said was just wrong, and I'll be glad to say why that is based on another empirical study I have um, in the Q&A, but I don't want to use my 15 minutes to give the talk I gave last week in New York about laptop use. Um, uh, so what I'm going to talk about is um, a natural experiment that occurred in my constitutional law classroom at Ohio State. Um, I didn't deliberately engage in this natural experiment, which actually makes it empirically a more sound experiment, so I wasn't deliberately changing my behavior to sort of affect the results. So the natural experiment is that over the last decade or so in my constitutional law class, which typically has you know, around 70 students, depending on enrollment patterns, um, I, in the middle of the semester, after we finished the first unit, which we just finished, I, I post a old exam question on that topic, and I tell students that they have two weeks, if they want to, to please send me an answer to that exam question, and that I will promptly give them feedback in writing on that exam question. Please submit it in Word so I can use you on know, the track changes of the device to give them feedback. And to also please sign up to meet with me individually, and what I do is I post all these 15 minute sessions and I ask them to please sign up to speak with me individually. Um, and the whole purpose is obviously to give them uh, feedback. Um, but I make it voluntary, because I know there's different styles of learning, and also just to save my own time, for me to do 70 of them is really hard, but it turns out that about half of the students take advantage of this opportunity. So I've been doing that for years, uh, probably about a decade or so. And um, this last semester or so, last year, one of my colleagues, also just in the first year, we shared the same students, and I was bragging, I guess, as I like to do, about this opportunity I give my students and how much I think it benefits them. And he says, well, maybe it's good for your students, but I think, in your class, I think it's bad for your students in my class because I think they're spending too much time in your class and not enough time in my class, and I'm not sure. I mean, he was more polite about it because he was not yet tenured. Um, and I'm usually chair of P&T, so, you know. Um, but and he's a very fine professor, and I know he cares deeply about his students, and I think he was serious about it. He was worried that it was having this collateral negative consequence. So all of a sudden, I was like, man, am I wasting my time? And then also, I started reading some of the studies on formative feedback, and there's one study that some of you may be familiar with from Andrea Corkio, where she found that um, when she gave her students formative feedback, that the top half of the class was disproportionately benefiting from the formative feedback. And I, I'm happy to teach the top half of the class, but honestly, I really wanted to vote most of my energies to the bottom half of the class. And so the idea that I'd be just doing something to raise the top, I knew that that was also a good use of my time. And I apologize to all you law review students who are at the top of your class. But um, <laughs> you know, I, I think we can understand why educators we would feel that way. So I also was concerned, you know, was I just raising the top and not really doing anything for the bottom half of the class? So um, I joined uh, three other uh, members of my faculty um, who should get full credit uh, for this work. Um, in doing an empirical study of what was going on, and we got IRB approval, and we found all, so we gave every student an anonymous exam number, so I wouldn't know who we were studying in our database, and we got their LTAT scores, their undergraduate grade point averages, their fall semester grades, um, their demographic information, their race, uh, their gender, um, and we tried to find out you know, whether it was fair to say that this formative assessment I was using was achieving positive results for the students in my class as well as the students in the other classes that they were taking. And obviously our hypothesis was that students who got the formative feedback in my class would do better at the end of the semester because obviously they had gotten feedback from me. I write the final exam. And so you would think I would give them some hints that would help them 
on the final exam. Um, and the format of, my, of the practice exam is the same as my final because I don't believe in time pressure time exams. We should talk about that at another conference. I've written about that also. Uh, I don't believe time pressure exams are the best indication of student learning. So although the bar exams time pressure, they should change, not me. Um, <laughs> and I, I'm serious about that, right? I mean, if people always say to me, oh, you shouldn't do that because they have to take this bar exam. I'm like, well, I don't, I'm not teaching for the bar exam. I'm teaching for student outcomes and student learning. Um, and so, so my, my final exam is a 28 hour take home, which isn't unended, you know, it has a time limit, but it's an artificial time limit, it's an administrative convenience time limit. Um, and my take home, they could, the, the practice exam they can take during the course of the semester, they have two weeks to find the time to take it, obviously they shouldn't be spending the full two weeks on it. Anyway, so my, so my practice question looks like the final question, in that sense. Um, and so what I found, the good news that I found, is that the students who took my practice question, on average, did about three points better on our 100 point scale than the students who did not, and that after controlling for undergraduate grade point average, LSAT score, fall semester grades, fall semester grades are the best predictor of spring semester grades, any law student can probably tell you that. Um, after controlling for all those factors, it was still statistically significant whether or not a student took my formative, took my practice question. So it did, now I can't prove causation, I only can prove correlation. So the group of students who chose to take my practice question did on average better on the final exam than the students who did not. Um, I don't know if those students would have done better on my final exam for other reasons, right, that correlate with taking the practice exam. I don't know that the act of taking the practice exam cause those higher grades. You're all with me, right? It's correlation, not causation. But correlation can be suggestive of causation, and I certainly hope that it's suggestive of causation in this instance, given the number of hours I devote uh, to, to grading these student uh, practice questions. Um, I also found we were interested in knowing, well, who takes the practice question? Um, is it just the ACE students? Is it, you know, who is it? And so there were two factors about the students who took the practice exam. Um, that caused them to be different than the other students. One was gender. Women were more likely to take the practice question. About 60% of my women over the three years took the practice question. About 40% of the men took the practice question. Even though my data showed that women on average benefited exactly the same as men on average. Okay, so one might say the men were making a bad decision here, right? That had they chosen to take the practice question, they would have benefited from it as much as the women, but women disproportionately chose to take it. The other factor we found about the students who took the practice question, so they had on average a higher undergraduate GPA. Not a higher LSAT score, but a higher undergraduate GPA. And that made us think that maybe that's because they had good learning styles, right, from college. They were used to being effective learners in college. They were used to taking advantage of formative opportunities in college. So when I made one available, they took advantage of it. By contrast, getting a high LSAT score um, may not be as a result of that kind of formative feedback, although it could be, right, because you can, can study for the LSAT, although all my students say that they didn't, so I don't know. Um, um, and maybe that's reflective of the student population I teach. You know, maybe if I was teaching in a law school where the entering LSAT score was way higher and students have spent more time preparing for it, maybe my results would be different. I only can say what the results are at Ohio State, where our median LSAT score right now is around 159 or 160. Um, so, 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 the, so the populations of who took differed, but, those factors were not predictive of how much taking the practice question benefited you. The students with high LSAT scores versus low LSAT scores benefited the most. The students with high undergraduate GPA versus low undergraduate GPA benefited the same. Um, so those were not factors predicting outcome. Those were just factors of predicting who took uh, the, the practice question. Okay, and then with the other really big question that I cared about, which was, and how does it impact your grades in the other classes, and I especially was curious to look up that faculty member who complained to me, how did they do in his class? Well, the good news is, on average, they did better in his class than the students who did not take my practice exam. We found a spillover effect, that the students who took the practice exam in my class didn't just do better in my class, but statistically significantly, they did better in all of their podium classes, the classes like my class, where they had one summative assessment um, at the end of the semester. To me, that was the best news of the study, right? That I wasn't just teaching them con law, 
I was teaching them, hopefully, to be more analytical, to think more deeply, to learn how to take an exam, you know, the, the rubric of taking an exam. My exam was always the only take-home exam they had this spring, so I also was wondering whether it would be sort of a spillover effect to, to classes in which the examination instrument was a timed instrument, but there was a spillover effect, even for exams that were very different than mine, even for exams that were multiple choice and time pressure. I can assure you there's no multiple choice questions on my con law exam. Um, so, uh, so that was really interesting and in some ways a surprising result. I did it, I, you know, I was sort of nervous about that. Oh no, what are we going to find? Um, but that is, that is what we found. Um, some other really interesting findings from our study that I wanted to share with you because I'm sure the people in this room care deeply about some of these other uh, findings is that um, um, I should say that uh, Four of the five of us working in the study are women, and the fifth is um, a, an ally of women. Um, he, he's our dean of students, who's very supportive of all of our students, certainly. Um, we were very interested in gender stuff that was going on that we could find in our study that might not have been the primary inquiry of our study, it wasn't so much related to formative assessment. Um, and one thing you know, we already reported is that women on average are more likely to take advantage of the formative assessment. The other thing we found, which was discouraging to me, is that although in my class, your gender had no, was not a factor in determining the outcome, was not a significant factor in predicting the outcome of the grade that you would receive on the class. In the other podium classes that my students took the same semester, and in each of those semesters, I unfortunately have to report, they were always taught by men. You know, we women are a distinct minority in legal education, as I'm sure you know, um, at the podium at least. Um, uh, so in the other podium classes that were, the students had that semester, gender being male was a factor predicting higher performance, even after controlling for LSAT, undergraduate grade point average and fall semester grade. I find that deeply disappointing. Um, and, but on my class. Now, why, right? There's no way we can answer that. It's because of my gender, it's because I gave the formative assessment, because I give a take home exam that's not timed. You know, do women on average do better in the untimed testing instruments? Women on average have a little bit lower LSAT scores nationally than men. My hunch is that's because of the time, heavily timed nature of the LSAT. If you haven't taken the LSAT recently, I would encourage you to do that as a faculty member, but you might want to do that. It's not the LSAT that we took um, to enter law school. Um, so, hard to say. The other factor we found, though, looking at our legal writing grades, there's probably the legal, legal writing instructors in this room won't be surprised by this. Women on average did better on legal writing than men after controlling for undergraduate GPA, LSAT score, fall semester grades. Well, maybe legal writing looked more like my class because you know it's a more of an untimed uh, writing instrument. So, um, uh, so that was an interesting finding, one that certainly I would, I would hope other people do more research in because I know we all care greatly about equity and if the fact that we have men in the front of the room is having a positive effect on men's grades, that's even more of a reason, right, why it's fair to our students for pretty much 50-50 these days in the classroom to have more women at the podium um, who may be instructing them in a way that for whatever reason is more receptive, um, et cetera, it's, it's hard to say. There was also a racial effect in our study, um, which those of you who know the literature on race won't be surprised to learn this. Now I should say, when I say race, we have so few, unfortunately, of students from each racial subgroup, African American, Latino, Asian American, Native American, that we couldn't <coughs> break out each racial subgroup. Um, so we have to lump all racial subgroups together, all non-white racial subgroups together. That's obviously not great, but that's the best we could do because that's the data that we had. Um, uh, race was not a factor predicting performance in my class. Race was not a factor predicting how much you benefited from the formative assessment. In other words, the full constellation of students equally benefited from formative assessments. However, race was a factor in those other classes students were taking in the spring semester that the white students did better than one would have expected given their full semester GPA, their undergraduate, LS, undergraduate GPA, their LSAT scores. And by contrast, right, the converse is that our students who were non-white were doing less than we would have predicted in those podium classes not taught by me, those podium classes that do not have a formative assessment. And so, you know, it does make me wonder, there's a lot of discussion in law schools now about why is it that some of our non-white students are doing what we might call underperforming? What are we doing wrong at the podium, right? Because they come in, 
equally talented. They come in talented enough as compared to the other students who share their LSAT scores, undergraduate GPAs, but yet they're not performing as well as them on average. What are we doing wrong at the podium that's real net result? Maybe one of the things we're doing wrong at the podium is not giving enough formative assessments so they can get the kind of feedback they need uh, to, to improve their performance. So obviously, we need more research on race in the future, um, as we do on gender. Um, and um, in my classes, there was no way we could code for the race of the faculty member because they had almost exclusively white faculty members and so you know I don't know how that would have been changed if the race of the person in the front of the podium um, was different um, but I, you know it, it seems to me this is a hypothesis that for whatever reason our non-whites are sort of acting like our women right now obviously many of our non-whites are women <laughs> there's some overlap there um, but if that's true um, that's something that certainly uh, deserves uh, further research and one just final little point little footnote I want to make is in look at, looking at how our research compares to the prior research um, there was, the Andrea Corchio study was one in which the kind of feedback that she was giving was just, here's a model answer, compare your answer to the model answer. Whereas Daniel Schwartz um, did a study in which people gave individualized feedback more akin to what I was getting. And what the Schwartz data shows from Minnesota is that the bottom half of the class um, disproportionately benefited from the formative assessments when your feedback was more individualized Corkio found that the students at the top of the class more disproportionately um, benefited from the feedback when it was more required more metacognition. Here, compare your answer to the model answer. We found no effect. We found equal distribution of results throughout the entire LSAT range, um, and um, I can't tell you quite why that is, but it, but it does say to me that when we think about formative feedback, obviously we want to reach the whole class. We especially want to reach those students who are struggling, so we really need to think about whether our formative feedback is effective for the entire range of the student body, and so although model answers are an easy thing for us to do as faculty, I'm not sure that that should be counted as genuine formative feedback if it's not benefiting the full range of students. So thank you very much. Um, Wait on the countdown. <laughs> is that going as for 15 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is even my time. <laughs> okay. okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, I first of all, I'd like to say I think for everybody else, thank you for inviting me over here to uh, give you this talk this morning. Uh, thank you particularly to the uh, Law School for um, setting up this conference and inviting me over to speak. And also to the organisers, they've done a fantastic job in organising everybody. I felt like loyalty since I've been here, since I got here sort of the early hours of uh, Thursday morning. Felt like absolute loyalty, apart from the very warm welcome I was given by your homeland protection guys at the, at the uh, Canadian border. <laughs> um, they were very welcoming and, and enjoyed a very long chat, despite the fact I'd spent 20 hours travelling. I just wanted to go to bed. <laughs> but, um, everybody else has been extremely welcoming and helpful. <laughs> to be fair, they weren't bad, they were very good. But, you know, I realise they're doing the job. <laughs> um, today I'm going to talk about um, formative assessment and peer review in terms of formative assessment. Uh, just to sort of, uh, I was sort of wanted to subtitle this uh, presentation, uh, uh, formative peer review with a twist, uh, and we'll come to what the twist is a little bit later. So I'll just leave that tantalising uh, over your heads for the moment. It's a very quick outline. Uh, so first of all, why do we need peer review? Why is peer review a good idea? 
Um, I'm going to actually look, I'll just say outline the, the study that we did um, at my um, institution uh, and also explain to you what the twist is. Uh, and also then I'll explain the findings of the study that we made and some of the implications of that for our students' experience. Um, the way the study worked out actually was uh, a little bit different to the way we expected. We expected to just do a straightforward study and um, we would have sort of certain findings and that would be the usual thing. Um, but when it actually came to it, it, it split into two stages and I'll explain the two stages as we, as we go along because the, the second stage really came from the findings of the first stage. So just sort of going in a different order. So first of all, why peer review? Um, one thing is a student, or traditionally a student's negative view of the feedback that they get. Feedback, of course, we all appreciate. Feedback is absolutely crucial to um, good student learning, and you know, good, timely feedback is absolutely vital. All the studies show, you know, in order to learn, students need good, timely feedback. Um, but all institutions, I think, across the board, uh, in all the student surveys, always get very negative comments on their student feedback including universities and institutions which otherwise score very highly on those sort of surveys. Uh, feedback's always the bottom of the list, so always bad, bad feedback. And obviously this is a matter of concern to all those institutions, um, even to the extent, you know, always, always looking for ways to improve it, uh, even to the extent I have heard um, stories, I'm not sure how true they are, but I've heard stories of colleagues who have had to hold up in lectures a board saying, this is feedback. <laughs> okay, because the students don't even understand quite often that what they're getting is feedback on their work, and um, sometimes that message needs to be pushed forward. So one uh, driving factor for this study was well, the traditional negative view that students have of feedback, and also um, numbers of students increasing, as we've already heard from some of the speakers this morning, uh, which makes it much more difficult for us as tutors to give the sort of individualised feedback that we need, that the students uh, need. So how do we do that? So peer review was a way of trying to tackle those sort of questions. So why peer review? Um, anybody who's sort of done this sort of work, anybody who's done peer review with their students will probably be familiar with some of the previous studies. It's not a new idea by any means, but some of the existing studies have shown that the advantages of peer review are things like this, you know, interactive learning of students, a, a, a developed critical analytical skills, it promotes the effective learning of one's own work. And a few of those are sort of things that are familiar uh, to you. Of course, there's a downside to anything, isn't there? Some of the disadvantages are things like this. It's quite difficult to manage. Um, getting the students on board, getting the students engaged with this sort of process is very difficult. Um, the, the, the evidence seems to be inconclusive about whether or not it actually improves performance of the students overall. Um, and also there are some considerable doubts about the credibility, validity, reliability of um, students reviewing each other's work and critiquing each other's work, commenting on each other's work, suggesting improvements to each other's work. And I'm sure if anybody get, say, has done any sort of peer review with the students, I'm sure this sort of comment uh, is not unfamiliar. <laughs> but isn't that your job? <laughs> are you supposed to be feedback, giving me feedback? Why should I take any notice of my colleague uh, who sits next to me in class? Why should I take any notice of what they think about my work? So, getting over that initial hurdle can be quite difficult. Okay. The study itself, what do we do with the study? Um, the study, we ran this um, across all four years. Now, in the institution I teach at, we actually have four years of law students. We have the traditional three year who are doing the um, law degree, the traditional straightforward three year law degree. Uh, we also have a fourth year, foundation year, which is for the students who haven't necessarily made the grades that they would have done or they would have needed to get onto the first year of the course. Uh, and the idea of the foundation year is to get those students up to the academic levels uh, that we would expect on the first year of the course. Um, but they still study legal subjects, they look at, you know, it's obviously it's more basic than a traditional uh, degree, but they look at, you know, they still look at legal subjects, contract law, civil litigation, um, public and administrative law, those sort of things. Um, so we looked at this across all four years, and the group size is very, between 25 and 35. <coughs> the, um, what we did was ask them to, everybody to prepare, a short piece of legal writing. Now this could be on any subject they wanted, as long as it was some sort of legal subject, because we didn't want you know, Chinese pottery or anything like that, but um, a short piece of formative writing, maximum 500 words on some legal topic. It could be something that was controversial at the time, something that was in the newspapers, some events that had happened uh, in the news, etc. Um, anything, as long as it was a piece of formal legal writing, you know, properly written out, referenced, etc., properly structured, 
Um, and then we got those students to share their piece of work with all the other students in the group um, using the visual, uh, virtual learning environment. Uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. But, uh, <laughs> the idea was, of course, that the students would review each other's work and be able to read it all, then sort of have them write it out and sort of pass it around and then say, well, I can't read that, I don't know what that says. Um, to have them um, type out a piece of writing submit it onto the VLA so that all the other students would then have access to it and they would be able to comment, leave comments, feedback, etc. either through the student forum or actually direct onto the VLA through a, a Turnitin link. Um, after doing that, and this is just a sort of simple exercise, this is sort of straightforward basic exercise just to give them the idea of what peer review was all about. The next stage of the study was after they'd submitted that, or after they'd done that particular exercise, the next piece of summative work that they submitted, because it's all coursework based, the next piece of summative work that they submitted, there was a mandatory requirement, imposed by us of course, um, that it be peer reviewed before it's submitted. So there was a system set up where within a, well, at least two days before submission, uh, that piece of work had to be reviewed by a peer. Um, there was, I mean, it, bearing in mind some of the criticisms of peer review, of course we didn't want to leave the students completely high and dry, so there was an option if the students chose to obtain a uh, tutor review as well. So besides the mandatory um, peer review, there's also this, an option for a tutor review. Uh, and then after the work had been submitted and marked, we conducted um, some short um, semi-structured interviews with samples from the group. We took, because of time constraints, we took three students from each group. So there's 12 students altogether that we took uh, and so, um, uh, semi-structured interviews with. Um, and they were sort of randomly selected across a range of people who got different marks based on the, uh, the assessments. Okay, what happened? So initial findings. Um, first attempt, absolute disaster. Technology couldn't cope, the system kept crashing. Uh, when one student submitted their piece of work, every other member of the student could see it. But of course, as soon as another student submitted some work, it wiped that out completely. You couldn't see the first student's work anymore. It was now replaced by the second student's work. Uh, unfortunately, me and technology do not have a happy relationship. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid I'm in a generation where these things are just you know, magic boxes and it's all wizardry. <laughs> but um, the... Um, uh, luckily, our IT guys could manage to find a system whereby we could get over some of these initial hurdles. But it was quite difficult initially to, to get things set up. Um, the student responses varied quite often according to the level of the student. A lot of the sort of students further up the school, the sort of um, level two, level three students, second and third year students, were much more receptive to this idea than the ones lower down. Um, also, some of the responses were, were a little bit more, or uh, well, varied quite a lot. Some of the students produced some very good feedback and, and actually did, you know, were quite conscientious in what they did and produced some very good comments on the other students' work. Others, you got comments like, it was okay. <laughs> that was good. I enjoyed reading it. <laughs> okay. So, not particularly helpful, not much of an insight into what the students have done. Um, we found, as I said, that the early stage students tended to be less confident in their peers and were much more reliant on the tutor feedback uh, than they were on, on what their peers had said. Whereas, um, you know, particularly some of the higher level students, some actually valued the peer feedback and thought it improved their work, and in some cases it did. Now, whether, again, whether there was a causative link between that feedback and the fact that their grades improved, you know, it's probably not proved, I certainly can't prove that, on, on, even on the balance of probabilities, I don't think I can prove that. But there was certainly an improvement in, in the students' work from previous work that they'd submitted where they hadn't gone through the peer review process. Of course, they may have just been improving the students naturally, but um, there certainly was a, a marked improvement in some of the students' work. Okay, so that comes to the twist. Um, and for the next exercise, I'd like everybody to get up and give us a demonstration of the twist. <laughs> I'm only kidding. <laughs> well, they have taken Susan's example earlier. Maybe I, should, maybe I should insist on it. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. Um, the twist in that case was actually student interns. We'd already been using student interns for other th uh, classroom activities with some of the sort of foundation and first year students. And they had proved very helpful. They're, they're either level two or level three students who come in and help with teaching activities such as organising MOOCs, uh, making presentations, group, group activity work, group, group submissions, that sort of thing. And we started to think, well, how can we improve on what we've already got? How can we improve, use the information we've got from this study 
to improve uh, the peer review system, why not use the student interns? Okay. So we did. So we've got the student interns, and there's only four of them, and bless them, they work really hard on this. Um, we got them to do the peer review. Now I know, I'm going to say, my tech, they're not peers, are they? If it's a third year student looking at a first year student's work, they're not peers, are they? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, they aren't. <laughs> Uh, but they are students, uh, and rather than tutors, um, and the students, you know, the, the interns, are the ones that have already been through the system. They know what is expected, or have a much better idea of what is expected from sort of foundation level and first year students. Um, so what do we find after the interns uh, intervened? Um, some of the students became much more confident in the review from the interns, not so much from their colleagues, but from the interns. Um, and we had you know, some of the comments where, you know, oh yeah, Mr X, he's, X is great, yeah, he's fantastic, gave some really good feedback, yeah, yeah, X's, X's um, review was, was actually better than the tutors, I understood X better, much better than the tutors, um, because, you know, because he's a student, and you know, he understands how we think, you know, we're just, you know, the tutors are basically just a, a load of old farts who don't really understand what, uh, what uh, these people are thinking, but the students can, the students can put it across in a way which is better than the tutors, which is good news for us. Might make us feel a little bit redundant, but yeah, it was good news for us. Um, what we also found was that fewer students, even lower down, began to uh, use the tutor option. More and more began to rely more on the, feed, the peer feedback or the intern feedback, uh, and there was a noticeable drop in the number of students that were using the tutor review. Um, some of the outcomes did improve. People did get better marks. Um, now, whether that was just the same, they were naturally improving as students, or whether that was a link to the feedback that they were getting. But certainly there was an increase in marks compared to similar work in previous modules where they hadn't had peer feedback. Now, of course, that is a very crude <laughs> and probably unreliable measure of um, improvement, uh, but there certainly was a noticeable improvement. And more importantly, the students felt more confident and felt that there was a contribution from the peer feedback uh, towards improvement of their marks. Um, and also, there's a, we found, uh, which is quite interesting, a divergence from some of the theories. Some of it correlated with findings of other work, so uh, the fact that there was you know, a difficult response, it was a difficult sell to the students to get them to um, you know, engage in this sort of process of peer feedback. Um, that seems to correlate with the findings of other um, studies, although some of the other studies haven't looked across a range of different years, they tended to focus on one group in one year. Okay, so what do we draw conclusion do we draw from this? Okay, one, make sure your technology is up to the job. So this was the, the big one we had at the beginning. Um, so on that basis, you know, make sure your technology is up to standard. Um, we found it works well for some students, not quite so much for others. Um, particularly the higher level students, or certainly the higher, so the second and third year students did sort of gain much more from this than probably the lower um, um, students. Although they did feel that the, the, certainly when the interns in, uh, became involved, that the, the, um, their confidence grew and also their um, marks and their performance improved. Uh, and finally, it, it needs to be sold to the students. You know, students naturally have this sort of, you know, oh, well, you know, this is your job, you should be doing this, why am I getting, why is, you know, who is he or she to criticise my work? <laughs> well, I'll take it from you, but I won't take it from him and I won't take it from her. But um, once you sell it to them, I think some of the students, or many of the students, do get on board and realise that there are some benefits to this. Um, and certainly the, the outcomes were improved once the, the, sort of the higher level peers, if you want to call them that, the, the interns, once they became involved, it became much easier to sell it um, and um, the students felt that they were gaining much more out of it. Um, that's um, I think all I have to say. I've just about used up my time. So thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, <laughs> So while we're getting set up, uh, again, I want to thank everybody who organized this area did a terrific job. Um, <clears throat> many of you are familiar with the positivity bias in research. And the positivity bias is uh, simply the phenomenon that uh, if you look at any scholarly journal in virtually any field, uh, the, the, the contents or the cover page is 
uh, full of remarkable new results about uh, the you know some incredible discovery about how some slight change can dramatically uh, affect the outcome. This is a pretty well established cognitive bias we have for positive results. And there's lots of sort of easy reasons to understand. We like things that go better because it's self-affirming and it's comforting and it shows you the glass is really half full and a lot of other garbage. The reality, of course, is, as we know, learning is, as several speakers have said before, hard work. So um, my own presentation today is a small contribution to try and undermine the positivity bias. I, I feel like I'm contributing to the negativity bias. Uh, so I hope that you will uh, have your biases uh, subtly balanced by this presentation. Um, so should you bother reaching out? Um, no, according to my research. I can't say that no, not definitively, no under any circumstances. All I can say is, within the limited context of trying a very small, early alert with your students, this is a quasi-experiment, so they weren't <coughs> randomly selected, and I'll explain how uh, in a moment. Within that limited context, the early alert combined with meeting with students that are lower performing doesn't have any statistically significant impact on their final grade. That doesn't mean it might not be good for a lot of other things, but to the extent that what we care about are outcomes, because of course outcomes matter, right? Even the negative ones, because they tell us something about what's really happening, not what we think, not what we feel, not what we would like to be happening, Outcomes matter, and it's uncomfortable to acknowledge, but oftentimes the negative outcomes are more instructive than the positive ones. So the idea of an early alert is very simple. If you see the way things are going very early in a process, you can correct it. Um, and there's, there are uh, lots of examples you can think about where you set some sort of early alert to tell yourself, uh-oh, am I going off course here, right? And, you know, airplanes and ships and things like that use these all the time. Well, so it seems very uh, intuitive that if we alert someone to a problem, they're going off course early in their, uh, in their studies, in a course, in a class, in their understanding of the unit, they can correct and get back on course. It, see, it seems so obvious. Um, I mean, it's, it's such a sort of commonplace triviality that you know, you'd be a fool uh, to even waste time studying it. Uh, well, here you all are listening to one. Um, <laughs> but the, the concept is so, is so intuitive, right? Hey, this is an alarm. Change what you're doing. Does it? Does it actually affect outcome? So there's been an explosion, uh, I, I didn't know about this, uh, maybe you do this, but there's been this explosion of early alerts. And now that uh, since sort of the mid-90s, people have been researching this. And then there are all kinds of contexts. Uh, this is an effort to try and get high school students to fill out the federal financial aid form for college because one of the discoveries is that, you know, as we're trying to broaden the number, uh, the range of students who, who get undergraduate education in the country, one of the things we discovered is that a lot of students don't just because they never fill out the form. So now there are early alerts, uh, there's been research where uh, students, uh, high school seniors, are texted, hey, you know, it's only 60 days till this, you can fill this out, why don't you do it? Um, and, and the research seems to suggest that you can change people's behavior for doing things like that. Most significantly, and it probably won't surprise those of you who have college-age children to know that the most effective aspect of that alert system were the text to the parents of the high school <laughs> students uh, that this deadline was approaching. Um, it can change behavior, but there's kind of mixed outcome on whether it can, mixed, uh, uh, mixed research outcomes on whether it can actually change someone's performance. That is, saying, hey, here's an alert. You need to be, you know, this isn't, this isn't going well. Um, so this is an effort to try and test that in a very small circumstance, which is in my class. And the idea here is 
whether a personalized early alert to students in my class could affect their outcomes. Now, I do a lot of formative assessments. I'm sure all you do. I have, you know, for over two decades, and so I've got, uh, you know, five uh, multiple choice online quizzes that students do in a first year criminal law class. So it's a required class. Students are randomly selected. <coughs> and everybody has to do these, and everybody's subject to the same you know, sort of input, namely me and all the materials and so on. The question is whether reach, giving some early alert to lower performing students in the class, and I didn't have the sort of deep dive of data that uh, Professor Coker had, so I kind of uh, identified the lower performing students myself based on the first, their performance on the first of these five quizzes. So the issue is, if you take the students who are kind of the bottom 15% on the first quiz, it's only two weeks of class, um, can you then, by intervening, giving them an early alert saying, hey, this isn't working, and meeting with them one-on-one, uh, -on -one, um, can you then affect their performance? Um, seems intuitive, and obviously, who wouldn't benefit by a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me? It seems like it's, you know, obviously, <laughs> the students are going to be, are going to get better. Um, again, it's one of these things that we take for granted in education. People meet one-on-one -on -one with students because, well, we think that we're counseling them and mentoring them and sharing our knowledge and helping them see the mistakes that they're making. Again, these are things we tell ourselves, I think, largely because we like to hear them. Um, so, this is my effort to try and test that. Does it actually do anything? So I take the bottom 15% of the students, and that's, that's the intervention group. Those are the people who have this one-on-one -on -one meeting. But what's going to be the control? Well, again, this is a quasi-experimental design. These aren't randomly selected students because I selected them based on their performance on this quiz. But the nearest group, the nearest comparable group, are the students who do just slightly better. So, you know, it's like a 10 or 12 questions quiz, so the students who get four or below, or, you know, four or three are the, are the intervention, and the students who get five are the control. Again, it's not perfect, but it gives you something to map. So, the outreach is very simple. After the first quiz, I email, uh, I email the entire class and I say, this is, you know, this is the average, this is the high, this is the low, um, and if you have questions, please contact me. And of course, the students get the analysis of all the questions and, uh, and, and the indication which is correct. Um, but I don't know what your reaction is, but virtually no students take up the opportunity on their own to come speak with me about why they got something wrong. To the intervention group, I send a personalized email, and I'll, I'll show you a, uh, give you a flavor of it in a moment. But it was, you know, dear Mrs. Jones, or dear Ms. Jones, dear Mr. Smith, um, I'm concerned about your performance on this quiz. It was, and you know, I inserted the actual score they got, and that was, you know, four out of 11 was dramatically below, you know, the median score, or the mean score of, you know, seven out of 11 or whatever. I'd like you to come in and meet with me and talk about it uh, so we can review your work in the class and ensure that your performance is, is uh, what you want it to be. So, um, you know, I guess it's a, it's a positive thing. Most of the students responded to the email by meeting with me. Um, this is also, of course, a test, as anybody who's looked at cognitive psychology knows, of the observer effect. Does it matter just sending out an email saying, I'm watching you? Um, and frankly, I don't care. If that improves student performance, that's good too. Um, but, you know, most students actually met uh, with me and I reviewed the quiz with them and, and went over uh, questions that they had <coughs> and kind of how they were approaching studying in the course. And about half of them had follow-up meetings with me, just on their own. Okay, so here's the personalized email. And obviously you can't read it, but, you know, it, it, it's kind of, you know, it's got these sort of italicized parts. It requires your immediate and continued attention. Uh, you know, you need this to be adequate to pass the course and succeed thereafter, blah, blah, blah. I mean, but this is really what it's meant to do, right? It's just, you know, it's a warning. Um, it's, hey, this matters. Come see me. Okay? So, um, the groups who came, the groups in the intervention and the control, were roughly similar to the class as a whole, right? Um, 
women were overrepresented. Um, but you know, in, in the in intervention groups, <clears throat> but you know, uh, not by a lot. Um, and, and these are very small numbers, right? So as you can see, this is class of 100 or class of 77. So you're talking about nine or 10 students in, in a group, um, not, not a tremendous amount. So the students who were the subject of this quasi-experiment were not um, dramatically different from the students in the class as a whole. So what happened? I met with the students one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we had sort of an intensive review of each quiz question, which basically was me saying, Okay, explain to me why that's not the right answer. Uh, and, you know, that rapidly became kind of, um, well, you really need to get deeper than that. Why, you know, what exactly is it right? Um, and what do you do to prepare for class? What do you do after class and that sort of thing? Um, and go see my colleague Elizabeth Bloom. And that was really sort of part of this, this strategy as well. Um, so those were the meetings. So the question then is, what happened after meeting with these students? Um, unbelievable response after the first quiz, after the, first, after the intervention. So here's the first quiz where I identified the students that were going to be in the uh, intervention group. Here's the intervention itself, somewhere in between the first and the second uh, quiz, which is the uh, meeting, one-on-one -on -one meeting with students. And then you can see the progress here. Uh, on this red line is the intervention group from, you know, uh, the control group or the class as a whole all the way down here, way up to there. Now, that level of progress is significant to uh, something like, you know, a, a P value of like 0 0.001. That is such extraordinary uh, effectiveness that if it continued, it would be the most effective educational tool in the history of the world. <laughs> um, and I'm a little disappointed to report it didn't quite go that way. Um, but what happened was that the students with whom I intervened, the red line, basically ended up about, oh, about average students. And they continued to perform about as well, if not a little bit better, than the control group. Um, and so you think, that's pretty good. You've taken students who are in the very bottom uh, cohort, and you've turned them into almost average students. Um, and that happened largely the second year. Um, now, anybody who sort of has done anything in statistics looks at that and says, well, yeah, everybody's regressing to the median. Um, but, you know, the, the, the point is, everybody may be regressing to the median, but at least everybody is now including the folks who are at the very bottom. But the acid test, the thing that matters is, what happens at the end of the course when you do a summative assessment? And for that, the answer is nothing. Nothing from a statistical sense. So the mean for the group, the mean final grade, uh, uh, average for this, the group I intervened with was 2.44, and for the control was 2.40. And uh, I'll tell you in a moment, that's not a statistically significant difference um, in either the first year I did it or the second year. A one one hundredth of a grade point uh, in the second year is not a statistically significant difference. How do I know that? I did a T test um, that shows that the T stat is, uh, is between the negative T critical <coughs> and the higher and the positive T critical, meaning we cannot reject the null hypothesis that I had no impact on the students. Now, that's the, the sort of first takeaway. Um, there's a couple of cautions, as there always are. Um, these are small numbers, as I mentioned, they're not randomly selected due to the quizzes. Um, and the early alert and outreach may reflect who did the outreach. So maybe, again, if my esteemed colleague, Professor Bloom, or any of you had been the person doing that one-on-one -on -one meeting, it would have done better. Um, and we don't know really whether it prevented even worse performance among the, the those performers. Um, but I think one of the, the real takeaways is something that won't be surprising to you is that the lowest performers really present the greatest challenge. 
Um, but what I really want people to be aware of is this idea that just because what you're doing, you think, well, it can't hurt. That does not mean it helps. And figuring out whether it helps is, is very, very hard work. Thanks. Thank you, panelists. I'm told we have 10 minutes for questions. Initially, no, it's just um, a basic outline of what peer review involved and um, what they would have to do to follow instructions in order to carry out the peer review. There, wasn't, there was no formal training given to the students. I mean, that's sort of, that's sort of something we thought of as a result of the, the outcome of the study, but um, yes, it wasn't something we gave them at uh, the initial, initial stages. Now that you've seen the great results of doing your formal assessment, is it required in your class now? Or? Uh, no, it's not, and, and that's in part because I really do think it's important to respect the variety of learning styles in our classroom, and it might be that the students are self-selecting. Our students are more predisposed to have a growth mindset and would benefit, and I'm concerned that if I insisted that everybody do it, that students might be resentful of doing it, that it's taking time from their other classes, they won't go into it with such a positive mind frame, a pro positive growth mindset frame. Um, and um, so, I mean, obviously there's my time, which I care about also, so maybe I'm just rationalizing. Um, but I really do think that the voluntary nature of the exercise is part of its success, because the students themselves decide to devote that time, and they go into it really hoping to benefit from it, and that's the only reason to do it, because it doesn't count, right? Um, and, and so I'm not, I mean, maybe someone else can do that study of a 70-person con law class and tell me what <laughs> results they found. Um, um, but I'm not predisposed to, ex to speak. Then I did this year tell my students that I had this data. And I suspect I'm going to have a higher response rate. Uh, my partner's in the audience. He'll see if I'm complaining all spring break <coughs> while I'm grading. Um, and uh, fortunately, I only have 59 students this year. So if they all do it, it can't be a, big, a number bigger than 59. But um, it will be interesting to see, I'm not going to continue to do my natural experiment, but it will be interesting for me to see that now that I've told the students that on average there's a three point grade difference, will they choose? Now, just one little, little anecdote is a student came to see me that got my 100 last year. They often want to come by the globe, right? And I checked my record, she hadn't taken the practice exam. And I said to her, I was really surprised you hadn't taken the practice exam. She said, Well, you know, my average for the fall was a 98. I thought I sort of understand what's going on, and I didn't, and I didn't do one in the fall. And, she got my 100. So it would, it might have been a waste of her time, right? She had the skill set. Now, of course, she affected my outcomes. But remember, I'm looking at your spring grades compared to your fall grades. One would predict when you have a 98 average in the spring, you're at pretty high risk of getting my 100 in the spring. And not taking the practice exam wasn't a big enough factor that it caused her to fall off the curve. Um, I have other anecdotes I can share, too. But they're anecdotes. I have actually real data. So one of the things we've seen is that formative assessments tend to help students who have higher metacognitive skills, who are self-regulated learners. I'm wondering for all of you um, who provided feedback in different ways, to what extent your feedback relied on having the students use self-regulated learning skills in terms of giving them rubrics to compare their work to, a model answer, things that actually made them do active learning as opposed to giving them your feedback on how they get done? Well, I actually did just the opposite. So, I mean, I knew about the men in cognition literature, and I wanted to make sure I was reaching the bottom half of the class, as I said. So for the students who did especially poorly on my practice question, and I'll say this in a published article, um, not only did I give them individualized feedback and talk to them about their answer and just their exam style of writing, obviously not just their knowledge of con law, I usually encourage them to rewrite their answer and to give it to me again. And in some cases, I asked them to do an additional question. So, I mean, I really did tailor the feedback to the needs of the student. And, and honestly, I must say, the time I was willing to devote to a student was essentially unlimited if they wanted to take that time, which is why I'm surprised at your results, because um, I, I do believe my data shows pretty concretely that I helped sort of save some students who really were at risk of failing. And that was, that's really my goal. 
I don't want to have to give any student a D or an F. Um, I will, obviously, they earn it. Um, but I think that I, my hope was with enough feedback I'd be able to avoid a D and an F. Now, I don't know if you had that outcome, that you actually avoided some Ds and Fs even if they still had Cs. Because that's a big difference, right? It's a huge difference. So, um, and, uh, well, I'm sure the students who uh, I was able to avoid having to give a D or an F to was because I was able to refer them to Professor Bloom and she sort of sorted it out for them. But the, um, the f interestingly, the very first year when I did this, um, the, I think there were like 78 or 90, 80 percent or whatever of people who I emailed actually came and met with me. The two students, and, and uh, Fess Goldberg pointed out to me, um, this is a small numbers problem, and it absolutely is. As I mentioned, one of the cautions, these are small numbers. Um, the two students out of 16 or 14 or whatever I emailed who did not meet with me, one withdrew from the course at the end, like didn't sit the exam, and one got a D. Now, that seems very you know, promising. It's sort of like, OK, there's some positive effect of meeting with me. And maybe that's the trajectory of that curve, the intervention. Um, the effect, though, may not be that significant when you look at what it is on the summative assessment in terms of the, the final grade. Um, it may be things that aren't picked up. Like when they met with me, they thought, geez, I really don't understand this. I better go to academic support. I better be more attentive about going to those meetings. Or, um, you know, maybe I can understand this, and this is how, this is what I'm going to need to do, though. Um, but, you know, of course, that's beyond the scope of my, my research. Yeah, I think I'm mean, very similar sort of findings for, for my study as well. Uh, we didn't give formal sort of rubrics or guidelines on the, um, the sort of feedback that they got from either their peers or from the student interns. So we didn't give any further guidance on that. But of course, the summative assessment was marked, and, and that would, that would also contain feedback on you know, other aspects of the work that um, you know, students needed to improve on. So uh, there was still some tutor feedback from that point of view, but that tended to be on the summative work rather than on the formative. So the formative with the live wall on the, the peers or on the student interns. Other questions? When you're measuring the bottom 15% yep. performance, is it relative? So is it that the bottom 15% on your first quiz still is the bottom 15% on your final? Or is there any way of sort of measuring like absolute performance in some way? So they get 40% on the first quiz, and they, but maybe they get 50 or 60% on the final, even if that's still the bottom. Yeah, so no, it's the former. I try, in other words, those are those are matched curves, so they're tracking the same students. So I, I identify the same, you know, 15, bottom 15% 15 in the first quiz, and then I track their performance on each of the successive, you know, four succeeding quizzes um, against the same matched uh, 12 or 15% of the next highest cohort, and then, you know, the, the whole class average. Um, so it is Compare, it's an apples to apples comparison. But the apples were selected in a non random way. Yeah, but, but you're, not, you're not seeing an effect where maybe those you know, bottom apples yep. are still on the bottom, but they're getting a little bit. They better. absolutely are. I guess that's, yeah. they absolutely are getting better as you, as you progress through those formative assessments. Yeah. If the ultimate question, though, is are they better when you do the final, when you look at the final grade? Are they performing better on the final grade than those you didn't intervene with, those two bottom cohorts? The answer is no. Can I ask a follow-up on that? When you say doing better on the final grade, it's a normative grade at the end, right? So right. it's still in comparison. Well, <clears throat> it's it's a grade, it's a yeah. So the the bulk of the final grade, eighty percent of the final grade is the exam. And it's blind grade, you know, I don't it's all by ID numbers and stuff like that. Um, so if that's what you're asking. It's a curve rate then. So we don't have a mandatory curve, um, but yes, this, the, they're fitted to a curve. Okay. That's right. Okay, so if this were the Oscars, they'd be playing the music in the background right now. <laughs> <laughs> we need to take a five minute break, but we could continue this conversation during the break.